Welcome back. Um, it's now my pleasure for the next hour, we will be focusing on the work of Lisa LaPlante and uh, the reactions of our various commentators. Lisa LaPlante is an associate professor at New England Law School in Boston, where she also directs the Center for International Law and Policy. Before coming to New England, she was at UConn and at UConn Law, and before that, she was out in the field in Central America, South America, and elsewhere, and um, has a very deep background in reconciliation work, et cetera. And her full bio is fascinating, and you have it, and I won't, I'd, we'd rather hear from her than have me just read about her. But her work today, well, she will be presenting a story on trials and memory wars, and then again, after about 25 minutes to half an hour, we'll invite our commentators and then open it up. But Professor LaPlante. Good morning. So first of all, I'd like to thank um, Linda, of course, and the conference organizers for not only the invitation, but a very well-organized event. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today, and I can already see how my talk will tie into the morning's discussion. So my paper is focusing on how transitional justice mechanisms like trials impact a nation's collective memory and conscience in the aftermath of atrocity. And in particular, I address that, uh, the fact that there's the assumption that there's one dominant memory of the past and that this is a natural outcome of transitional justice mechanisms. And I contend, in, in, in fact, that there's multiple collective memories, in some of which justify violence. And I question whether this multiplicity of memory challenges the overarching aims of building a culture of rights, the rule of law, and reconciliation. And to explore this argument, I focus on national trials, and in particular, the trial of Efrien Rios Montt, who was a former dictator in Guatemala. And some of my observations come from my role as a trial observer of this trial, which took place this past year, a part of the Open Society Institute monitoring project. Their blog is behind me on the screen. You oh. If you want to find it eventually, you can just Google Rios Mont OSI, um, and you should be able to find it. Um, Rios Mont right there is, uh, is the picture on the left. So basically, just the breakdown of my talk, I'm going over collective memory as a part of transitional justice. I'll talk a bit about the history of Guatemala, the, their transition, the trial. Um, and finally, I'll be uh, sharing some of my observations from my research. So to get us started on the background of collective memory. So memory has attracted a lot of attention in the literature and transitional justice. In, in many of these countries that undergo transition, they prioritize memory making as a part of their political agenda. And certainly we've heard stories about memories being aired through public testimonies, most notably in truth commissions. And a lot of times these stories get put into an official report that aims to produce a public record of the past, to, 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 uh, to set the public record straight, especially if there's been an official denial of systematic human rights violations. In the beginning stages of transitional justice as a field of study, there were a lot of theoretical claims about the field, and, and one assumption is that these processes lead to a collective memory that helps redress the past and prevent future atrocities. And this notion implies that there's one dominant collective memory that overrides all other competing memories. And also that A, that human rights violations occurred, and B, that they were wrong and never justified. But with the increase of empirical research, there's been a, a new line of memory scholarship that recognizes the nuances of collective mem memory in transitional justice settings. So for example, they recognize that memory is highly contested in post-conflict settings. One of the, the most uh, uh, well-known books by Alexandra Barona de Brito uh, and her co-authors uh, published in 2001 coined the idea of the politics of memory. And they remind us that there is a contestation between different groups, memory makers, who actively promote their version of the past and for very different reasons. And a very simplified breakdown of the, the two most obvious sides of uh, categories of memory makers are those who deny or suppress the truth, uh, wanting to move on. These are often associated with the perpetrators and their supporters, and those who want to reveal the truth in order to ensure accountability and recognition of suffering, and these are usually the victims and their supporters. 
But this tension doesn't end once transitional justice mechanisms are activated. Instead, they usually increase, and especially when the political stakes are high. And so what's interesting, though, is how transitional justice mechani mechanisms change the terms of debate within uh, this larger uh, quest for memory. So for example, once transitional justice mechanisms are instituted and produce evidence, it becomes impossible to outright deny the facts of the past, but those who uh, at one time wanted to suppress the truth often then offer a new interpretation of what happened, producing yet another collective memory. So again, this reinforces the idea that there's not just one collective memory in post-conflict reconstruction, but instead many contested versions of the past. So, after violent conflict ends, a memory battle begins. And this battle takes place in newspapers, in TV, in radio, blogs. And the dynamic reveals that collective memory is not simply just a collection of mental snapshots, but it's, it's ideas, it's images, it's recollections that are filtered and interpreted to present a particular understanding of the past. And it's not always a done deal who's going to actually win this battle of interpretation. So this phenomena of memory battles presents a paradox for transitional justice. On the one hand, uh, the, it's uh, creating tolerance for different interpretation of the past promotes the ideals of democracy and debate. On the other hand, when a particular collective memory, let's say that of the military who justify uh, and explain away atrocity, wins out, it challenges the political project of building a culture of rights and the rule of law. There may be other consequences as well for this memory battle. For example, the impact on victims uh, who have to contend with a continued rejection of their truth. So my research in my article today explores this paradox as it relates to criminal trials and most notably the one um, in Guatemala, although I have studied other uh, trials, in particular that of Peru. So focusing on trials is an important new direction in memory scholarship, uh, namely because trials were not, have not been a part of transitional justice projects, and in fact, truth commissions emerged as an alternative to criminal justice, uh, especially because of political negotiations and amnesties. But some gradual changes have brought trials back into transitional justice. For example, the creation of the international tribunals, Yugoslavia and Rwanda being uh, some of the first international criminal court. But these tribunals are far from home. So what's, m for me, most interesting are national trials that happen within countries, and especially in Latin America due to some important decisions that came out of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which basically overruled uh, the amnesty laws in Peru in the Barrios Altos case, but then said this is a general rule for the whole region. So what you have is a rise of national trials in a lot of Latin American countries. So for example, uh, former Peruvian president Alberto Fujimori in Peru, uh, militator dictator uh, Jorge Videla in Argentina, most recently Rios Montt in Guatemala. These are the big fish. And so it's important with this new development that we observe, study, and evaluate the impact of these trials in national settings. Now, a few scholars like Mark Osiel have explored the relation between trials and collective um, memory and views the courtroom as a valued venue for civil discourse and what he calls dissensus. And like other scholars writing on collective memory and transitional justice, he assumes that this process will somehow reach a clear consensus on interpretations of the past and that it'll even be a cathartic experience. He contends that prosecuting wrongdoers allows for a critical assessment of social norms and rebuilds social values of what he calls administrative massacres, how the, those rupture and destroy these social values. And like OCL, other scholars contend that the courtroom serves as a more neutral arbiter of the past and somehow brings uh, about a resolution and even reconciliation. So I call into question this claim. I question whether one collective memory can ever dominate and if reconciliation through consensus is ever possible. And at the same time, I observe that small changes in interpretation may be important gains over time, and they may occur over generations. And I base my assessment on my observation in, of the case of Guatemala, which I'll now give some historical background on. <clears throat> 
So Guatemala had a 36 year long dirty war uh, between after the coup of um, uh, the overthrow of socialist president Jacobo Arbenz in uh, 1954, which led to a series of brutal military dictatorships until a peace accord in 1996. And one of the most notorious of these leaders was General Efrian Rios Mont, who ruled for about 17 months starting in 1982. And under his rule, he conducted what was called the scorched earth strategy that targeted ind indigenous villages, which were deemed to be sympathetic to the uh, guerrilla opponents at the time, who were uh, basically, it was the communism versus capitalism Cold War. Um, type of uh, battle. It would take about two decades to actually uh, begin to document what happened during this episode when uh, the United Nations helped to form a truth commission in Guatemala in 2004. Uh, Guatemala, it was the Historical Clarification Commission, uh, Comisión para el Esclarecimiento Histórico. And one of the um, Important things to note is the Truth Commission's mandate did not allow it to individualize responsibility. It's very much separated truth-seeking from criminal justice, uh, but it laid the groundwork for the eventual trial of Rios Montt. <clears throat> and I don't have time to get into all the details of what uh, the different steps that led to the trial of Rios Montt, but it's important to note that uh, criminal complaints were filed as early as 2001, one of which by Rigoberta Menchu actually went to the Spanish court seeking to extradite him there under the concept of universal jurisdiction to hold him to account. There's a great documentary um, called Granito, How to Nail a Dictator, if you're interested in that story. And he avoided facing charges for many years because he was actually a Senator, so he had political immunity. And some seemingly fortuitous events actually suddenly made justice possible. And one of them was the, uh, the uh, naming of a new attorney general in 2009, uh, Claudia Passi Pass, who created a special court system and uh, special judges to deal with high risk cases, many uh, in terms of human rights violations and also the courage to bring Rios Mont to trial after he finally left Congress and lost his immunity. So the hearing, uh, which began this past March, you, you saw a picture, which is no longer there, um, of 86-year-old Rios Mont, and the primary uh, charges against him are genocide and crimes against humanity for 15 massacres uh, of the Quiche region of the Ixil indigenous people. He also stood trial with his intelligence advisor, Mauricio Rodriguez Sanchez, of the theory of command responsibility. So this is the first time that a former head of state was actually uh, tried for the charges of genocide in a home, a home court. So it was a very historical trial. Now, the trial uh, featured about 100 victims and who gave strikingly similar testimony. The only thing that changed were the names in the villages. So witness after witness told stories of uh, massacres, rape, killing of children, elderly, the burning of villages, the slaughter of animals, the destruction of crops, massive displacement, death by hunger, sickness, and bombing as they sought refuge in the mountains. And forensic anthropologists gave details of ex execution-style bullet holes in the bones found in mass graves, and many of these bones belonged to children and the elderly. In the meantime, the defense's strategy was basically to use a legal mechanism called embato, which is like an injunction to con constantly present legal challenges on due process of the defendant, um, many of them uh, orchestrated by themselves. They presented about 100 of these challenges that led to the trial actually being temporarily suspended at different points. But nevertheless, uh, the, the head of the court, Judge Barrios, um, carried the trial through to a final verdict in May 10th, and, and Rios Mont was found guilty as charged for genocide and crimes against humanity and was sentenced to 80 years in prison. But before the ink could even dry on the 700-page decision of the court, the Constitutional Court of Guatemala, on a techni technicality, annulled the decision. And the trial now is uh, suspended, is supposed to go back to uh, where it concluded at the closing arguments, and there's a lot of questions of what court it can go to, 
uh, if it's even possible to have a new trial starting after all the evidence if the new judges haven't actually heard those witnesses. So it's unclear what's going to happen with this trial at this point. So importantly, during this trial, there were a lot of debates occurring publicly about what was being talked about in the trial. And one debate in particular while I was there really drew my attention, and in part because it was visible. People actually had banners with these uh, mottos, which were, si hubo genocidio, y no hubo genocidio. Yes, there was genocide. No, there was genocide. And I've since conducted an archival research, archival research of newspapers to, to document this debate and how it occurred during the course of the trial, and I'll, I'll be sharing some of my findings today. So in the camp of those who deny, or rather who said there was genocide, very adamantly simply pointed to the trial and the evidence of the testimonies, and interestingly, a lot of the defense lawyers said, well, these are so similar, they almost sound coached. Whereas in the public debate, the credibility, the legitimacy of the court proceeding uh, actually didn't necessarily lead to this conclusion, but in fact, it seemed to suggest there were systematic violations. Look how similar these stories are. In, in addition to the military plans that were introduced into evidence, which showed that these weren't just excesses or mistakes, but instead a part of a systematic plan. So the policy called for uh, annihilation of armed uh, guerrillas in the Mayan villages who provided food, shelter, and other assistance to the internal enemy. The strategy took place within the larger, as I mentioned, anti-communist uh, anti ideology of the Cold War, and it conflated Mayan population with the concept of an internal enemy. So one commentator uh, in, the, in a news uh, opinion said, the state wanted to eliminate the Ixil people. And this seemed to be clear evidence that there was a genocide. And uh, what's interesting is many of these confident assertions did not occur when the Truth Commission published very similar stories and testimonies. And, and in fact, when I, one of my interviews that I conducted down there with an editor of um, a book publisher, uh, he said that actually after the Truth Commission it became very hushed to talk about the violence. I, I suspect some of that was the assassination of um, Padre Gerardi, and, and maybe that was a part of the reason for why it wasn't talked about. But, but what I, would, I, I can t believe is the difference is that the Truth Commission did, did not have public hearings, and it also did not have a lot of media coverage, whereas the trial had a lot of media coverage, and, and that alone, and I've written elsewhere about the role of media um, in, in collective memory, especially as they re relate to trials. So in a way, at a minimum, the trial forced the Guatemalan society to grapple with its past. Um, and maybe the debate alone is an important accomplishment of the trial. So the other camp of there were no genocide, they began their campaign even before they heard the evidence. And even the president of Guatemala, um, Otto Perez Molina, declared publicly, in Guatemala, there was no genocide. Outside the courtroom, there were often protesters who wore banners on their arms who entered the courtroom saying, no hubo genocidio. And they create, the, part of their reasoning uh, for, although it doesn't make a lot of uh, logical sense in terms of looking at the evidence, but their whole thing was, one, why, aren't, why isn't the other side being tried for their contribution to the conflict? One uh, interesting man who runs a, a group paid for lengthy inserts in newspapers that basically were just rants about uh, the justification against terrorism uh, and also calling the civil parties and the prosecutor terrorists. And then, and actually the next day after this insert came and I went with a group of students and some of the students actually went to this protest where he actually bussed in, I think it was maybe 30 buses of Ixil people um, to go and protest on behalf of Rios Mont, and later it came out that they were promised seeds and fertilizer, and they had no idea what the banners actually said. So you can see memory makers trying to produce an interpretation of what was being produced um, during the trial. This created a lot of confusion and distress for the other victims and an division within the communities, um, uh, which is an important question to ask in terms of trials and their impact on uh, local communities and victims. So other genocide deniers focused 
on very technical questions of intent. They analyze the criminal law and how it reflects a genocide convention and whether in fact the evidence actually shows intent. Um, but what's important about these, uh, the analysis that they provide and something that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't talked to local people is that they actually say, okay, there were massacres, but they are not genocide. But what's interesting is they don't come out pro-defendant. They actually think, okay, Rios Mont needs to be held responsible for massacres. And before, massacres were not even acknowledged. So one important outcome ironically, of the, of the genocide deniers is the acknowledgement of massacres. And in a lot of ways, this is an important evolution in the understanding of the past. So there are many different motivations for the genocide deniers. Uh, some, like I just mentioned, are very technical. Some are very concerned about the image of the country. Uh, they're motiva motivated by the fear that it condemns and stigmatizes the whole country. Uh, this sentiment, interestingly, uh, contradicts theorists who think that trials actually individualize guilt uh, and avoid collective guilt. But in the case of uh, many commentators in Guatemala, they're afraid of becoming the lepers of the global community, the new Nazis. Um, and that's a part of their motivation in, in trying to move away from the label of genocide. So moving back to the idea of collective memory and sharing the experience of Guatemala, I pose that one of the challenges presented by the case study is to ask, so how do countries reconcile the existence of multiple collective memories? And if multiple collective memories coexist, can countries still promote an overarching goal of transitional justice to condemn the atrocities of the past and ensure the rule of law moving forward? So Guatemala provides a clear example of how societies may hold multiple collective memories that arise out of group dialogues, which are interpreting the past. And the question is how these multiple collective memories inform the develop of a collective conscience, one that will demarcate right from wrong. So the, the difference between the idea of collective memory and collective conscience is something that sociologist Emile Durkheim has written about in terms of our understanding of the past, but also a shared morality, and that somehow punishment is a, a tangible example of this the collective conscience um, in action. But this viewpoint also seems to assume that trials will easily convict the guilty and reinforce a collective memory that condemns the past. It also assumes that national conscience plays a key role in preventing future atrocity, which is one of the primary goals of transitional justice, the, the nunca mas, the never again that we heard this morning. And on this point, Mark Osiel uh, has argued that, quote, the best way to prevent reoccurrence of genocide and other forms of state-sponsored mass brutality is to cultivate a shared and enduring memory of its horrors and to employ the law self-consciously towards this end. However, OCL leaves undefined who is in control of this self-conscious exploration and whether it will always lead to a clear condemnation of the past, especially if it's left to democratic debate. Moreover, can this clear condemnation be guaranteed without a conviction? So, for example, is it enough that there was a trial of Rios Mont and all this evidence came in, although his conviction currently has been annulled and we have no idea if he will actually ever be convicted for the crimes of genocide in, in crimes against humanity, which would correspond to the massacres. And again, it, it introduced important evidence, which now makes it impossible to deny the facts of the atrocity. But do the powerful elite believe that atrocity was wrong simply because that evidence was produced in trial? And so I would say that this model, uh, Durkheim's model, can be crit critiqued as somewhat of a na naive assumption about the power of law in that it overlooks the role of memory makers outside of the courtroom who are constantly uh, promoting their interpretation of the past. And in a fine, even where there is a final court conviction that condemns the past, a society does not instantly inure itself to this judgment. And instead, collective conscience is created through political memory battles 
between competing factions of society. And so memory makers respond to law and its judgment and influence whether society will adopt a shared understanding of the past. And so ultimately, in, in Guatemala, time will tell what the collective memory will be in the conscience and who wins this battle. And in the meantime, the memory makers need to just continue fighting for their interpretation. Thank you. Keeping with our procedure, uh, we will invite our commentators to come forward and join Professor LaPlante. They are Erica Tyndall, Attorney Erica Tyndall, who is the chair of the Connecticut Board of Pardons and Paroles since 2011. Prior to that, she was the executive director of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and prior to that was the deputy director of New Haven Legal Assistance. Um, she was also a prosecutor down in Florida before that. But she will bring her insight, as well as two of our second year law students, Michaela Kurzawa, who is a member of Law Review, um, is on the uh, e-board of the Society for Dispute Resolution, and has been in federal court and in a corporation as, as an extern, and Kim Osborne, also a member of the Law Review, who's been externing and interning at the Waterbury Public Defender, and also is a yoga instructor, as she put in her bio. But we will first turn to Erica Tyndall and then move on to Michaela and Kim. Good morning. What a nice turnout for a 70 degree day in November. Um, <laughs> First, I would like to thank uh, the School of Law and the Albert Schweitzer Institute uh, and whoever was responsible for organizing um, this important symposium on this very important topic um, and for inviting me to take part and for Professor Linda Meyer for the personal invitation. I'm, I'm honored to be here and to participate um, in, in this conversation. I'm also always very excited to read the work uh, of, you know, people who are, are, are writing about this and transitional justice is something that um, I don't know a lot about. Um, but I am uh, the chair of the Connecticut Board of Pardons and Paroles, and the board is the state agency that's responsible for uh, figuring out which parole eligible inmates get released and under what conditions. We also have the responsibility of deciding which offenders should be legally uh, forgiven for their crimes after having paid a debt to society. Um, and this includes full expungement of their criminal record and also grants of clemency and commutations of sentence, including the death penalty. Uh, so as you can imagine, the idea of memory battles and memory makers uh, and high political stakes uh, post-conflict, if you will, the conflict of, of serious crime having impacted Connecticut communities certainly hits uh, close to home, as I read uh, Professor LaPlante's uh, paper. Um, in many ways, parole boards and pardons boards are in the business of helping communities transition from conflict and informing the collective memory of, of what occurred, of that crime that occurred. Um, so it is within that context that um, I view Professor LaPlante's examination of memory as it relates to criminal trials as a transitional justice mechanism. Um, the paper's really well organized and makes a very strong case, I think, for uh, recognition that criminal prosecution, even a successful one, um, of a human rights violator challenges and frustrates the development of collective memory of events in a way that has tangible impact on a country's ability to move beyond an oppressive past and prevent future atrocities. And if you look at the comparison to what I do in my work, um, offenders in Connecticut are certainly uh, brought to task on you know, the crime that they have committed, uh, the harm that they've done, um, and we impact and, and help inform uh, the memory of the community and, and of the state around um, how both the, the crime victim and the offender will move past that and prevent uh, future crimes, uh, certainly by that particular offender. Um, I look forward to the integration of the examples of the, the, the two arguments. One, that um, genocide of the indigenous, is it Ixil? Ixil people, um, occurred. Uh, and two, that while atrocities took place um, as a result of a perhaps necessary fight against guerrillas, or someone views that as necessary, posed a threat to, to Guatemala, um, that these atrocities did not amount to genocide. I find that a very um, interesting dichotomy. Um, it was an admission, really, that yes, this, 
they were almost forced, I think, as a result of this trial, to admit, I mean, how could you not, with, with all of the uh, evidence and, and the hundreds of, of witnesses, but the argument being, is, is that really genocide? Um, I'm also intrigued by the notion that genocide deniers are concerned with the condemnation of the entire society. Um, that's, that's very interesting. I'm wondering how it is that protecting Guatemala's world image is productive to you know, its political and, and social transformation. How does that help them somehow? Um, and I also look forward to a fully developed conclusion of regarding the influence of Guatemala's cultivation of its collective consciousness on its path forward. It'll be very interesting to see what that uh, constitutional court does regarding this, um, this conviction. Um, so, you know, Professor Meyer had mentioned earlier in the day uh, a parallel path about um, uh, victimization and offending. Um, and she was referring to a clemency hearing for uh, a Connecticut inmate who, and you sort of know the story, she had been uh, convicted um, of a count of, of murder, uh, which as you know is, is something that's premeditated, and as well as having a um, firearm illegally and of um, uh, getting rid of that gun illegally, hiding the evidence, because after that shooting she sort of threw the gun. And as I look um, at this body of work around memory makers and who informs the collective memory, I think about it within the context of this clemency hearing because there are, of course, um, obviously, uh, it was a criminal trial in which someone was convicted of having done something, um, but the, you know, sort of the memory of whose who's, uh, memory of what actually happened, there were you know, several versions of that, and so I found that very interesting, and I, th I thought, um, I can see definitely the parallels between the work of my agency and, and um, how you know, this state agency informs the memory, collective memory in Connecticut of the crimes that occur and how that moving forward, how we look at the crimes that occur and the harm that's done uh, to communities. So thank you very much uh, for that work. And I, you know, I'm excited to learn more about um, transitional justice. So thank you. Thank you. Michaela. Okay, well, um, thank you, Professor LaPlante, and thank you, Ms. Tyndale. Um, closer to the Sorry. Um, I was really excited when I found out that I was working on um, an article about Guatemala because I worked um, for a nonprofit in Guatemala for two months in 2010, so um, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the things that that strikes me about the whole idea of a truth commission, and it's something that Ms. Tyndale actually commented on, is whose memory do you choose? Um, especially when you have a truth commission who's creating a report, how do you take an entire country's um, recollections of what happened and put them into one nicely tied up, presented idea of this is what happened here? Um, and even a more striking example is, is with the victims themselves, there are often conflicting um, stories and tales about what happened. I know before we went to Guatemala, we were assigned to read a book by Rigoberta Menchu, which, um, as Professor LaPlante mentioned, is um, she was a Nobel Peace Prize winner in 2002, or I mean, I'm sorry, 1992. And um, she was from the Isha region. Um, she was able to, she, she lost a lot of people in her family, and her book um, graphically and, and horribly detailed how she lost these people. And um, so you, you read the book and you connect with her on this, this personal, this emotional level. And then after we finished reading the book, um, if you Google her, there was some conflict about whether what she said was actually what happened. Did she exaggerate some things? Um, so we felt betrayed. I mean, you, you spend this whole journey with this woman reading her story and, and connecting with her and sympathizing with her. And then um, you wonder, was it all true? But then you also wonder, does it matter? I mean, if, if it came from this, this thing that did happen, does it matter if a few details were exaggerated? Um, does it matter if it's not an exact account of, of what happened? And um, even, even more interesting, when I was in Guatemala, we did go to Neba, which is one of the three towns in the Ishil Triangle, and um, we were told not to bring her up because the people were resentful of the fact that she had gotten out and she had written her story and she had benefited from it in this way. And so um, it was 
very interesting in that regard to see victims who were not necessarily on the same page with what had happened and, and had conflicting versions. And so, um, as Ms. Tyndale, Tyndale mentioned, um, it goes back to who, whose version of the truth do you choose? Um, and so I think that the way that, that I have come down on it is really, I think it's more about the process as opposed to having that, that finalized report at the end. Um, I think that also the trial factors into that nicely because um, whether or not you get the conviction, you have the chance for, for other people to tell their story. And like you said, with the media on, um, on a much grander scale than they could otherwise. And so I think that I don't actually have an answer about what <laughs> the best version is for having the collective memory at the end and moving forward with that. But I think that it's important to, um, to have that process and to have the people have the chance to tell their stories, whether or not they're conflicting, whether or not they, they line up perfectly. And um, then when you have the process of finding the truth as opposed to focusing on a truth commission report and having that, that finalized result, I think that um, that is in a way more healing for some people. I mean, a lot of people have talked about mediation today and um, an important aspect of mediation is sometimes people just want a chance to tell their story. And so when you have atrocities like this, perhaps they need more, perhaps they need a conviction, but um, it's a great starting point to be able to just have that forum to tell what happened and present your evidence and, and have it heard. And so um, I think it's a very complicated area. I don't think there are clear answers, but um, I think talking about it at all is a really great start. Great. Thank you. Kim. Um, oh. um, yes, thank you, Professor LaPlante, and thank you, Attorney Tyndall. Um, and thank you, Michaela. I, um, I concur with um, how you said that you think it's more about the process. Um, I think it's more about the, uh, the discourse um, throughout the process. Um, I also enjoyed hearing about Professor LaPlante's um, direct experience, um, speaking with the people and how they felt. Um, and that's kind of takes me to my, my sense of what memory is. Like when I think of my memories, um, like maybe a certain Christmas, I'll think about how it smelled, how it looked, how it felt, what the noises were like, um, my sen like my senses, how my senses took it in. And um, uh, Professor LaPlante asked, um, is it enough, the trial? Um, was that enough? Um, and I don't know if it was enough, but I think it was um, significant in that the, some of this testimony was brought to light. Like how witnesses told their own story, their own direct experience um, about systematic rape. Um, the killing of elderly, the killing of children, um, and they had a chance to describe what that looked like, what that um, felt like, what it, or even um, bringing up the buried, you know, the mass graves, what that, what that looked like, what that felt like, what it smelled like, um, and I think that that could contribute to a collective memory um, in cre and not in that finding that one is the right one, but maybe a discourse about it. And all factors could come into that, even um, the protest and how um, they were kind of paid with uh, farming and seed, um, things like that. That could even be a part, this happened. Um, and um, I don't think it's about choosing one or the other. I think that a collective memory maybe could be the entire discourse, um, focusing on the personal direct experiences, um, how people perceived it with their senses, and not, you know, this, you know, creating uh, or not spinning it in the media, maybe. Um, and so, but I think it's this is an amazing inquiry. So thank you. Great. Let's have a. Round of applause for our commenters so far. And now we have a good 15 minutes for dialogue to open it up for, uh, but we'll start to ask uh, Professor LaPlante, is there any reaction you'd like to have to the comments first before we take some questions? We have a few minutes if you'd like to. Only that I appreciate on the thoughtfulness and, and grappling with what it means to have memory, especially if it gets you to go to your personal 
way of having memory, I think that's an outcome that I didn't necessarily plan in writing the paper, but it's a nice one to hear about. So, in the analogy with the actually something domestic like a parole decision that um, it's, it's always uh, gratifying to know that a, a framework could be useful in other situations. Great. So comments, questions? Yes, sir. In the, the parole review process, do you look to um, the outcome of the trial or do you look to evidence in the trial or what, how do you figure out what happened then? <laughs> That's a really long answer. Um, we look to the outcome of the trial, which was the conviction. The reason why um, the offender is in front of us is because either they pled uh, to charges or a jury convicted them. Uh, we, we do occasionally have, um, I, I think it's only occasionally because I think inmates feel that they should come before the parole board and say, yes, I did it. But we do occasionally have people who are insistent that they did not, and they have a different memory of what, and I think they're fighting for um, their story to be, this, this is what, what happened. Um, so occasionally that does happen, but what we do is we, our job is to use our discretion to figure out um, of the population of parole eligible folks, who is the best candidate to be released early? Who's the least likely to recidivate? Um, and can we put conditions in place that will help them not, that support them and not um, committing other crimes? But I, you know, I, um, I think the whole process of, of discretionary parole release is all about what uh, Professor, Le I think there really is a framework that the, the crime victims who often come in and either give statements uh, or testify before us have their memory of what happened, what it smelled like, what it felt like, how they were impacted, the harm that was done to them by this offender. The offender has, is fighting for their own uh, stake in that memory. You know, I'm not a monster, I really, here's what was going on for me. And then we also, as the parole board members, we sit in panels of three, have our stake in, 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 the, in, in creating that memory too. So we do look at the trial, if, if the offender tells us something about the offense and we have a transcript of, of something different, you understand what I'm saying? There's, so we, we do go back to it in that way, but um, we do not retry the case. We, we get lied to. Uh, and we check that with the, the information we have. Um, but so that's within the context of the trial, that's how that happens. But I, I really do think trials are a place where um, everyone's fighting for the, the official record of, of what happened, the official memory. Um, so I, I, I do see some comparisons there. Just to add, I, I do think it's important to consider the, the stakes, um, which might be slightly different. In the case of, for example, President Molina, who during the trial, uh, testimony came out that he was the head of a military group that actually was responsible for a massacre. He has something to worry about, just like other, uh, other people that were involved in the conflict, the economic elite especially often supported these campaigns for their own uh, benefit, and they have something to worry about too. In fact, I, I forget um, the the other Guatemalan president that was just extradited to New York for corruption charges. The victims, well, part of it is reparations, their story they have to defend, and so maybe Rigoberta Menchu felt like she wouldn't be taken seriously unless she gave a really powerful story. I guarantee whatever she said, it happened somewhere. Maybe it didn't happen to her but also just their dignity, their, that they are, one, not terrorists, and two, that something really horrible happened to them, and they need acknowledgement. That's what we talked about this morning. They don't want just, I am sorry. They want acknowledgement of what they went through. So I guess it's important to recognize that in, in claiming a version of the memory, there's always some motivation. There's always something at stake, and it can be very different depending on whoever, you know, the different memory makers. So... Yes, Hope. So um, this is just, uh, I guess, something that comes up for me. So, so I helped um, 
a little bit with, um, I'll be talking about this during my comments later on today, but thinking about how one might form a commission of inquiry for post 9-11 human rights abuses. And a big piece that came in was thinking about the scope. And I was curious if you could talk about the scope of sort of what is relevant or not relevant, because you could even take the example of um, a parole hearing, right, where it seems like it's going to be a fairly discrete set of events. And yet, from the offender's perspective, in fact, if we're going to go in, as, as Linda was talking about, into a whole history, there could be personal history. How do we even start to talk about, say, structural racism, for example, and how that sort of affects who is before the parole um, commission to begin with? And so it, it quickly can grow and multiply, and I just was curious about, in the case of Peru, I mean, given that the history of colonialism and all of, I mean, there's many, many reasons why people might, in fact, want to narrow the scope and at least call it just, well, let's just at least talk about this one massacre in which there are sort of objective facts rather than talking about power structures that are at play. Because I think that when you talk about what's at stake, it's both whose version of events, sort of discrete events, but also kind of who's these, these sort of larger systemic issues, mm -hmm. um, I think is in some ways what's being played. Are you asking about the Truth Commission yeah. in Peru and Guatemala? Yeah, in terms of how did you set a scope of sort of what was sort of relevant and what wasn't? Um, so I don't get too much, I have done a lot of work on the Truth Commission in Peru, um, so I'll answer outside of the paper. Um, but one thing that your comment just made me think about in terms of, uh, and it's not in the paper, so this is great, I can can include it, the, the stake of having it be called genocide, because I keep wanting to, I'm trying to figure out why is it so important, because I think it's significant crimes against humanity, and, and in reality I think it's because it is racism. and this violence happened because it's a country that's incredibly racist and the indigenous people have been historically marginalized, their land has been taken away. Um, and so the label of genocide is significant to reveal the structural inequalities. What's really interesting though is that the Guatemalan Truth Commission is actually one of the few that got into the structural inequalities. Um, and if you, in, in reading it, um, it's, in reading the report, it's a pretty progressive approach because a lot of truth commissions, like uh, South Africa, is very highly criticized for not getting into apartheid, really just focusing on the isolated crimes without getting into the context. Peru did context. It wasn't per se a part of, it was, it was kind of written into their mandate. I think the challenge, though, is, so for example, in the case of Peru, they did the whole thing. They did 1980 to 2000, which included Three presidents, it included um, one of which was a clear dictator, one that, you know, this, it, so there were all kinds of things that they had to cover. And truth commissions generally don't work for a very long time. So at the same time, it's often a, a, an interestingly enough legal approach because you're trying to prove crimes even though they're not prosecuting. So you want to focus on isolated emblematic cases, which they did while also presenting a more general picture of why and the consequences. And, and so I think, um, and I haven't spent a lot of time on the Guatemalan, I've read about it, but I haven't, I don't have the same experience studying it that I do in Peru. I would tend to not favor just isolated events. I would, I would tend to favor context because I don't think anything's gonna change until you address context and the underlying reasons for conflict. Um, and so in a, in a society that's trying to do the never again, you have to look at why it even began at all, which is you know, the real question of conflict prevention for me. So that would be my personal, if I were to advise your project. Um, now what would not, you know, post 9-11, that's an interesting, I know there's a different, there's been different efforts to create that kind of commission, which I think is fascinating, so. And not? And then. Thanks. Um, uh, my, my question is actually a continuation of the previous one. Uh, I'm worried about the concept of collective memory, and, mm -hmm. and you use the word memory maker to use that concept. Um, you talk about the whole thing from 1980. I'm worried about the whole thing from 1880, 1780, uh, 1680. 
how does collective memory, I, I'd love for you to elaborate on how does collective memory go into producing a history? Um, all these memories are people who went through things now, whether they be particular or collective, but the collective memory is the one that goes into writing the history books. And I remember our shop, really, when, when Howard Zinn put out um, People's History. How do you get to that? What kind of memory is there? I, that is a challenge to some collective memory that was there. Um, it's a different type of memory mm -hmm. there. What he's looking into, what he dug up, what we dig up when we go into archives and things like that is, is a challenge to collective memories in general. Um, and I'm wondering, you're talking about the collective memory right now being created. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we challenge old collective memories? Uh, if we're not how it is. And, I think that we understand that a memory maker imposed their interpretation of the past, and we just accept that there's different interpretations. And that's what his book does brilliantly, is he offers another perspective. I think the risk is, is that we teach history as though that is the only version of what happened. And what's fascinating is to look at a context where history is being cho chosen. They're choosing their history right now in Guatemala, which history is going to win. But I also think that um, and, and his book is a perfect example. What's fascinating is memory makers, uh, the contestation never goes away. And so you do historically have things that happened in the past that continue to be contested. And so in some ways, I think my whole point is, thank God for the memory makers because they're always challenging that there isn't one collective memory and maybe we should be okay with that. What worries me though, and this is my legal this is, you know, me as a lawyer. Well, if human right violations occurred, they occurred. And we need to acknowledge it. And that's where I struggle with, with I kind of think there should be a dominant uh, collective memory. There were violations. They occurred. They were wrong. Um, how do I reconcile that, though, with the idea that there may be different interpretations of the past? I haven't really come to a happy, comfortable place with that question. So, Could it possibly be there's a different on reasons why they happened and the accountability and acknowledgement, so. Well, I guess what worries me is, okay, so let's say that he, uh, the genocide conviction stands or even the crimes against humanity. I think in this room, and, and I only gave you a tiny sliver of the evidence, I, I think we can all agree something really horrible happened right. in these villages. So if there is a conviction and there's still a accepted collective, collective memory that it was okay because it was justified, that worries me because it essentially says moving forward, the bullet and then you cry. It is saying it's okay to do that if there's a good enough reason. And there's sometimes when, you know, what our, I as a human rights activist lawyer, my whole life mission is to say, no, actually you can't do whatever you want in certain, cer certain circumstances. It may be naive to think that the law can protect against atrocity, but I think part of our work as memory makers is the rule of law and the culture that you can't do whatever you want. So that's what worries me about ex living with multiple collective memories. True. Ryan, did you uh, want to make another comment? I was just going to ask about trust. Uh, I think in this country, a lot of us, maybe not everyone, can take for granted a certain amount of objectivity in, in something like a truth commission that would come out, say, say there was uh, Professor Russell's idea of a post 9-11 truth commission. Most people would probably agree that that's probably what happened because these people came together and decided that's what happened. When you have a society that's so fractured, like a lot of the Latin American countries, I was wondering what you thought about how do you control the impulse that a lot of groups will have, perhaps justifiably, to label the entire thing as a cover-up? or to label the entire thing as, well, that's not really what happened. This is just what the official people want us to think of what happened. This is what this group wants us to think what happened. Maybe something else happened. How do you, how, I, I, how do you deal with that? It's one of the collective memories. 
And so their version of if that co a cover up is a collective memory. But how does the Truth Commission? How does the Truth Commission deal with that in terms of its presentation of what it comes up with to the, the broader public? Well, I, I mean, I think to some extent, truth commissions have their mandate. They do their work. And, and I've written about this elsewhere. The real work begins after they publish their report. It's the dialogue and the debate and people's reactions to it. Their mandate is clear. They collect evidence. They collect testimonies. They assess. They analyze. The record is there for everybody to interpret and come up with their own analysis. I don't know that it's up to the Truth Commission to have to deal with that. Politically, they might have to if it means funding or somehow their survival in the country. But there's always going to be people that aren't going to be happy with their work. Okay, I'm going to take a couple more questions, and then we'll see where we stand. Shelley, Nir, and Linda. We'll see. Uh, I think that the whole discussion has, has uh, pointed to a very interesting uh, issue of using the word truth, right? Because even a criminal trial isn't real, even though you know publicly people think this is what they expect. They expect that it's going to be a truth finding mechanism, and it's not real, right? I mean, it's the discourse. Everybody has recognized here the value of having people come testify and having the inquiry. But I think part of what what maybe it would be helpful to recognize is, don't you think that there isn't a truth, even in a criminal trial? Right? I mean, it's not a truth finding mechanism. It's a discussion and it's a recognition that you know something happened. Doesn't matter. It's precisely what. I mean, I guess there are facts, there are bones, there are bullets, there are events. I don't know if you would call those truth. Maybe you'd call them facts. And then you have different versions of how those facts came about. And that could be somebody's truth. And there could be different truths. Right. But is that a problem when you say, oh, it, does there have to be a truth? Do you need to use that word is what I'm saying? And, and I actually don't use that word as much in this paper. That's why I use collective memory. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I, I understand that truth is an ambiguous term and that it's not. I mean, truth commission, though, how can I get? I guess I can't really get away from truth commission, but I think it's interpretation. Well, because we, because the whole field is based on uh, drawing a line between the past and the future. I mean, the whole field is about determining that atrocities occur and the consequences that need to happen. Well, I, I mean, in the sense of how do we understand what those, what is it? it? Maybe we just need to be comfortable with the fact that transitional justice, that is what it is trying to do. And then we have to look at the impact that it has on societies. So, here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a great paper. Uh, maybe just about the previous comment for a second, maybe it's helpful to make a distinction and say that uh, even though the truth isn't ever completely embodied by one uh, policy of transitional justice, some policies are better at embodying more of it than others, at approaching more of a comprehensive story than others. Um, perhaps, <clears throat> sorry, perhaps trials are uh, better at uh, establishing facts about individual occurrences and individual times, truth commissions, if uh, they don't shy away from it, like the one in South Africa, uh, can get at some more institutional factors uh, and are worse at the uh, finding God about specific uh, cases in specific times, maybe. Uh, I wanted to say a word about um, collective memory, and uh, I think one of the reasons why it's so difficult to sort of get to consensual uh, memory is that people have a pretty basic need to feel self-justified. Mm -hmm. People have a pretty basic stake in feeling self-justified uh, as a psychological fact about us, regardless of their self-justification feeling is merited or not. And that need is stronger when conflict is live than it is when it's in the past. And, um, 
for that psychological purpose, and even for a tactical purpose, if you're somewhere, a strategic purpose, whatever you want to call it, if you're sending somebody to uh, fight in a war, or to risk themselves in a war, or to you know, take an economic hit in the name of the war, they can't at the same time think about themselves as a perpetrator of crime against humanity, even if they are. Historically speaking, when collective memory tends to emerge, and this is a little cynical, but it's either when the entire, when an entire indigenous population has been decimated and the stakes aren't very high anymore, as in the case of Australia, for example, um, or when a very, very long time has passed. And then, you know, see the case of slavery here. Everybody can agree exactly who the perpetrator was, who the victim was, and that there's a very clear division of responsibility. Uh, but it's very, very rare. This goes back to the Ninth paper, very, very rare in cases of live conflict, and it goes back to your comments, uh, to have an agreement about the uh, historical responsibility. Perhaps in some ways, a reason to be optimistic uh, in that's account is that that conference could take place in the heart of uh, with a set of conclusions that was deeply undermining for uh, Israeli self-justification, bracketing whether they deserve for that <coughs> justification to be undermined. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree, but what's, it's making me think about in terms of the role of a trial even more than a truth commission that in essence they're picking a collective memory. So that's the difference, I mean, with situations where it's mediation and other non-final judgments like a court. So does that mean, because if the court doesn't say genocide, does that mean there's no genocide? And then that chooses a collective memory. Right. You know, there's a striking, on the same thing, there's a striking difference between two trials in Israeli uh, history. So in the early 60s, uh, <coughs> in the early 60s, Eichmann was uh, kidnapped in Argentina and brought to trial in Jerusalem. That's taken as an opportunity, essentially, for historical education. Uh, and it's a show trial in many ways for, you know, the, the guilt wasn't in question. All along, yet, the prosecutor, the prime minister, there, there's an open confession that this is a show trial to sort of educate the young generation of Israelis that didn't have complete access uh, to the Holocaust. Um, and that's a memory making moment. Then, about 20 years later, uh, and this I remember watching uh, live in the 80s. Uh, there's the, the trial of Ivan uh, Dimyanyuk, who was a concentration camp uh, official uh, from the Ukraine. And he gets acquitted on a technicality uh, before an Israeli court in Jerusalem uh, and sent back uh, to the US eventually. And that's a very, very different kind of moment, whether it's just a regular, much more of a regular trial, or whether it's a sort of statement that we can much more afford to be concerned with the rule of law. How, how did that decision, how is that decision taught? It's not really taught. It's not taught. It's not really taught. It's not very interesting in some ways. They're not, so it's not sound. Although the rule of, and that's another thing I don't talk about in this paper, but future project, the whole idea of rule of law and how the trial enforces it or doesn't, maybe the acquittal is an example that there is rule of law. I mean, it's not really an acquittal, actually. It's annulling based on a, a technicality. So that's... I think it goes to her point as well about truth. Right. That's a, that's a, that's a perfect example. Doesn't mean it didn't happen just right. because... Right. Yeah. So. Well, when it shows the limits of criminal trials as a mechanism for transitional justice, you need the restorative and social justice and criminal justice uh, working as a coordinated response, if you will, yeah. to achieve um, in order for societies to be able to move forward from the past, going past that line that you mentioned. Good point. Did you want to make a final comment? What, what, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I just wanted to comment. I like that um, coordinated response mm -hmm. idea. Very good. Final comment, and then we'll break. I just wanted to raise the issue of the, the forgettingness, right? So we, when we pardon people, we forget things. Um, we say that we're not going to remember this anymore. And I think, um, especially with this sort of idea of never again, we're always looking to the future and building these memories. And so it's always about, you know, I keep, I'm just 
had the trauma of helping my daughter get to college and writing those those statements, you know, those personal statements. You know, that's an exercise, right, in, in creating a sort of memory of who you are and not just who you are because you want to be accurate about the past, but because you're looking to the future and who this person is going to be and gonna, where they're going. And so there's also this sort of future element of the memory making. Um, whether it's we need to remember this so it never happens again, or we're not going to remember this so we can go forward. Who is Guatemala going to be? And with that, we will take a 15-minute break. And so we will be back here. I'll be a little loose with that. Why don't we say 20 of so we can get back on track? 20 of. Thank you for your comments. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you very much, everybody.